All right. Okay, we're recording this episode, and Keith has just walked in. He got his phone. He's got his glasses, his stash, his Adidas t shirt. He's dressed all in black, as Keith always does. Um, yeah, this is all recording good. So, hey, you, and welcome. My name is Mike, and I've got laryngitis, which is why I sound like this. But, you know, I um, hope you're having a good day or night or morning whenever you're... Or maybe it's not good. Who knows? Uh, maybe the weather is shitty. Yeah, probably driving. That's when I listen to my podcast, when I'm driving. You're probably driving. Um, yeah, you never know. Maybe in a hot sunny day as we're putting this out as it's summertime. Or maybe you're in the southern hemisphere and it's wintertime. I, who knows? Brr, you know, it's chilly. Um, so yeah, Keith, what's going on with you, man? What is going on? Not much, man. Just, you know, working away. Before I started recording, you had so much to talk about. And now as soon as I pressed record on the, on the <laughs> microphones, you're like, what's going on? No, no. Yeah. Uh, I blew all my load earlier. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, that's why I tell you, save for the pod. <laughs> yeah, oh, oh, do you remember what I was telling about, like, the houses? like a little bit could be potentially oh, a little bit haunted yes your house is haunted yeah so i feel i'm kind of if it was a movie i feel i'm on like the build up the ramp up to it because like it's just a little weird things are happening mm -hmm. so well this is terrifying for me because i'm terrified of moths but i was asleep in the bed one uh during the night yep. last week at some point and i woke up and i felt like a fluttering in my mouth oh. and i was like what is that i kind of woke up and then i was like oh. and then a moth flew into my mouth Whoa. and died. Why are you serious? That's fucking creepy as fuck. And gross. Yeah, that is. Well, that mostly gross. Yeah, that's really fucking weird. Are moths attracted to like bright things? So, yeah, it, it's like, really fucking weird why it would go into your mouth. That is like sort of a horror movie. It was like, yeah, it was like, it's like the, what's it, the Silence of the Lambs with the moth? The, yeah, yeah, the death's head. Like, you're going to wake up tomorrow and your mouth is going to be just full of moths and it's like crawling in. That's your room will be covered. Man, that's creepy. It's like, I don't know, when something dies in your mouth, you know it's going to be a bad night. Yeah, no, that's not, you're not up to a good start there. Was it like a big? Yeah, it was oh, huge. Dude. It was nasty. It was off. And then I like, had to go into the bathroom. Obviously, I like, used like, a ton of mouthwash. I brushed mm. my teeth maybe like five or six times. Yeah. And then I was awake. Yeah. You know? Now, <laughs> and then now your night is ruined anyway. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, fucking off. Yeah. But yeah, absolutely gross, man. But yeah, it feels like yeah. it's like something weird. Like the start of a, a weird horror movie, you mm. know? It's going to start from there. It's going to escalate yeah. from there. And I hate, I hate moths. Hate yeah, moths. I know. Like, and they just fly right at your face. Yeah. yeah. Like, do you know when you go into the bathroom in the middle of the night and there's a moth that's coming through the yeah. window? Like, they will, they will hit you. They'll oh, they'll go over you. Yeah, they yeah, they yeah. want they want you. They're yeah, after yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I know. No, they're, nah. And actually, I've a tattoo of them off. I don't know why. Yeah, what the hell is that about? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's like you're like Batman getting your worst exactly. fear yeah, on you. Yeah, 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 exactly. Good for you. Yeah. Okay, well, that's cool. Going out fighting moths at night. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> they feel hanging moths like around my room like, <laughs> as a warning. <laughs> yeah, exactly. With my little cocktail sticks. Yeah, like, fuck yeah. you. Little heads on it. But uh, so what else is going on? Uh, we were talking before we went on mic that we both had been to music concerts. Last night I went to see Interpol in Dublin and they were excellent. Yeah, how uh, was it? Great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, got, it was good. It's just they're not an outdoor band. Like, they they play great and the venue is great. It's just, you know, they're an atmospheric, moody kind of band. You kind of want to see them in the wars. Like, the time before they, I seen them last night was a couple of years ago in the Olympia Theatre in Dublin. And that's a really good venue for because yeah. it's really intimate mm -hmm. and moody and kind of gothic. Yeah. So it was perfect for their music. So that was better. Um, but no, they were great. Yeah, it was fun. It was. It's a good venue at yeah. uh, Trinity College. I was. I've never actually been to a gig in Trinity College. Um, yeah, it's bad. Yeah, I, I, it's I've, I've been in Trinity College. Uh, yeah, yeah. Not as a student. <laughs> yeah, near as I. Yeah, <laughs> didn't get close to doing that. <laughs> but uh, I know the grounds, and I thought it would be like a really cool area for a gig. But uh, yeah, I is. know what you mean about the atmospheric thing. Yeah, you kind of, especially those sort of. Um, well, atmospheric bands you need the light show and yeah and exactly and they're slower darker songs they don't like work as well when it's like outdoors and it's bright lights and cars and shit yeah. you know what i mean yeah, yeah it yeah. just doesn't i get it i get you i get you you hear my barking big dog I do man good how's billy talons unreal yeah yeah man i love billy talons mm -hmm. uh, like the first time i went to see billy talons i was, I was around 15 maybe, mm. maybe yeah about 15 Maybe a 16. young buck. Young buck. Yeah. Young buck. Young dumb full cop. Yeah. Well, you're rock and roll. <laughs> Absolutely, man. Rock yeah. and roll, my guy. Who would it be? And then I got oh, yeah. <laughs> But uh, yeah, they were brilliant. I like since then. I've just I've seen them. Uh, I don't know, like uh, maybe 10, 15 times. 10, 15 times. Wow. Well, I've seen because I lived in Canada for a while. And they're, oh, they're, they're from. They're, are they're, they from Toronto? They're uh, close to Toronto. Not from Toronto. I, I can't remember the name. The area. Yeah. yeah. They're the Greater Toronto, Ontario area. Yeah, from Ontario. Yeah, um, as far as I know. 
but they're uh, yeah, I know they're brilliant band. They seem to go a few times in Canada. And, yeah, but uh, yeah, just like big ball of energy, the band. Does, yeah, yeah, it's brilliant. Like, <laughs> yeah, man, yeah, yeah. Brilliant I know like good. two Billy Town songs, but I really do like the songs that I. It's just one of those bands who every time I listen to them, I like them. And you, I know you're a big fan, and you showed me loads of the songs, and I do. I think they're really cool, and I like all their songs. Is I never listen to it by myself. Yeah, like, I never yeah. think, oh, she doesn't be able to tend. But if you play it, I'd be like, oh, this is cool. It's a good song. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. It's just it's never kind of occurs to me. Yeah, It's one of those rare bands for me where, like, there's bands that I like a lot, and, mm. but there's still songs on the album where I'm like, yeah, I could do without that. Skip. Skip, exactly. Skip. I don't yeah, put yeah. on the party playlist. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, where Bill Bill Tandle, I'll put the album on, just listen, start to finish. Yeah, like, yeah, like yeah. That. All just, killer, no filler. Exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll go. I love it. Yeah. It's the ship. Great band. Oh, yeah. I have something for you. You do? Yep. Oh, cool. Oh, Thank you. A wee little gift, man. You did? Yeah. First for the pod. <gasps> I think you like this. Whoa, it's a book. Okay, I like it. The cover of it is really cool. Halloween, vintage holiday graphics. Uh, edited by Jim Heinemann. Wow. It's really, really cool. So to tell the viewers at home, it's it's all these pictures of like these retro Halloween um, like posters and pictures from like the 50s and stuff like that. And beyond, it's really, really cool. The art is amazing. It's really good, I isn't it? it? And I was thinking um, it could be good because I know you're creating a bit of a wall here with yeah, photos. Yeah, the stuff. background where I'm filming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It could be good even if you want to take them out and put them in uh, put them in a frame. You could frame it up. That is cool. Yeah. I love this, man. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course, dude. Thank you. This is great. Um, well, uh, I guess I can give you something if you want something because I, I mean... I don't know what is the story. It would be rude not to. It would be. I feel bad, man. <laughs> I would look like an asshole. So now I kind of have to give you something. But um, there's been some weird happening with the posts lately where I've been getting two of everything for some reason. Like, I'm not even ordering it. The post just like, keeps delivering. It's happened like three times in the last like month. That's amazing. Oh, it's great. I yeah, keep yeah. getting free shit, but I'm like, uh, you, you already delivered this. You've already gone to jinx it. Yeah, yeah I know. Yeah. Should have said it. Oh wait, if if any of the people who are sending me shit are listening, uh, no, we didn't. I actually didn't get any of them. <laughs> But here you go. Uh, I can give it to you. It's a book, right? This is interesting. It's uh, a guide to haunted New England. Speaking of creepy stuff, let's get into this whole episode. This is a long intro, so sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> this is not one of those podcasts where we just get into it. Yeah, yeah. No, we should do shit. We should do shit. <laughs> Fuck it, I'm having fun. Yeah, <laughs> I do. You do. <laughs> I'm having a few cold ones talking to you. True crimes in real life. Exactly. Yeah, some dark history. Some, today is dark history, actually. Today's episode is all about dark history. Mm, yeah. Duffy's Cut. Ooh. The Dancing Ghosts. Now, this is an episode. This is the first one Keith has actually researched for the podcast, so I'm excited to do it. So, if there's nothing wrong, you can blame me. Mm. <laughs> do you want me to yeah, go through the episode? I'll read it. Yeah, go ahead. So, okay, so you... I have some, I have some extra stuff that you do? I found. Yeah. All right, let's go for it. So, in this episode, we're exploring a murder cover-up that took 190 years to come to the light of day. This is a bone-rattling journey through history and the paranormal, and trust me when I say that this story has it all, folks. It's got the murder, it's got the cover-ups, and it's got... The Irish! The Irish! Yo. Watch out, Scratchy, he's <laughs> Irish! <laughs> and of course, it's got some ghosts thrown in there for good measure. In fact, in a way, these haunting apparitions actually helped with solving their own murder. We got one of them ghost solves on that. I love those ones. Mm. No resting in peace for these ghosts. So get ready to join the dance with the ghosts of Duffy's Cut in Pennsylvania. Let's give it a ghoul. Ooh. Oh, I like you put that in there. That's <laughs> yeah. pretty good. That's a, that's a little cute flavor turned in there. I wrote that especially for you, man. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. So the story of Duffy's Cut originated in the year 1832 when the ill-fated John Stamp ship set sail from Derry, Ireland. Some people say Londonderry. Mm. I say, what the fuck is a Londonderry? <laughs> and it was carrying 57 Irish immigrants seeking a better life in America. Mm. Their hopes were high as they journeyed across the vast Atlantic, unaware of the horrors that awaited them. At Duffy's Cut, they fell victim to a gruesome massacre that would echo Try the ages. Echo, echo, <laughs> To begin this tale, we are actually going to fast forward a bit to the Watson twin brothers. That was Frank Watson, a Lutheran minister, and William Watson, a historian at Immaculata University, Pennsylvania. And they were both born as their twins on October 25th, 1962. These twin brothers first became aware of the tragedy at Duffy's Cut through the ghost story their grandfather, uh, Joseph Trippikin, 
told them. So it was a Thanksgiving tradition for their family, you know, where their grandfather would tell ghost stories. In fact, actually, at Thanksgiving, which I celebrated in America back in November, we told ghost stories. Really? It was oh, great. Is it a thing? No, we just did oh, okay. it because I just like ghost stories. Oh, okay, okay. I just enjoy ghost stories and I'm always fascinated to hear them and tell them. So we just started telling ghost stories. I think I brought it up as like, then we got ghost <laughs> yeah, stories. It just started out in the blue. Like, I know, I love ghost stories. Yeah. I love ghosts. Me I think too, it's yeah. so good. They're just great. I don't believe in ghosts, but I just think they're, I just love telling ghost stories. Yeah, we do. There's actually, there's a, we'll, we'll get to it, but there's a good ghost story that I found that's related to this as well. Oh, really? Yeah, it's good. So yeah, it was tra- Thanksgiving tradition where the, the grandfather would tell ghost stories, oftentimes from his days working as president of Pennsylvania Railroad. But there is one story that resonated with a young 10-year-old Frank Watson. One Thanksgiving, as tradition, the grandfather gathered all the family on the front porch of their suburban family home in Philadelphia, where there were several rocking chairs and a sofa. On this calm evening, they all got comfortable and settled in to hear another one of grandfather's tall tales. Gather round, young one. I'm gonna scare the shit out of you. No, no, not again. (laughs) On this occasion, he brought a typed written manuscript from the Pennsylvania Railroad Company from 1909. Came with props and everything. Yeah, it just brings a bit of, uh, just he validates the story. Like, a bit of hard proof. That's what's good in a ghost story. Yeah, it, exactly. I guess with ghost stories, it's always like word of mouth. Mm-hmm. But this is like, no, 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 no. This is this is written down on the transcripts. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's not bullshit. It's written down. It's yeah. real, guys. And he, what, like, he was he was quite high up as well. Um, like he was, well, he was the, present. Well, he was a railroad executive who worked under the president. Oh, he worked uh, under the president. Okay. of the Pennsylvania Railroad. But yeah, I'm, uh, I know that the president, uh, the president of the Pennsylvania Railroad, who he worked for, he done a lot of gathering this information and okay. and, and documents. So that's how it came to his ah. uh, possession. Okay. So the story they told that night was about the fifty-seven Irish immigrants who had died and were buried in a mass grave in Chester County, Eastern Pennsylvania, and the dancing ghosts of Duffy's Cut that haunted said grave. The story, it went like this. In August of 1832, just a few weeks after the last man died at Duffy's Cut, the following account was gathered from a local unidentified, quote, old resident, unquote. Here is a transcript of that resident's paranormal account. You believe in ghosts, mister? No? Well, don't laugh at what I'm telling you, for what I say is true. I ain't had any whisker neither. And if you feel like walking, I can take you to the very spot and show you the place. You recollect what I told you about the cholera breaking out in 1832? Well, it was on a warm, murky night in September. I was down to the green tree and started to walk home on the railroad. Well, when I came to Duffy's Hill... Duffy's Hill, right? That's... Duffy's Phil. Hey, I, I wrote it down as Duffy's Hill because I wasn't sure what a Phil was. I'm not... I, th- I think something to do with railroad. So, like, okay, basically, I'll, I'll, they, I'll, I'll keep it as fill then because I wasn't. Basically, sure. like the railroad was coming through this like jagged area. Like it was a lot of rock and stuff. Like it was really difficult to cut through. Yeah, and, and they were on this uh, this railroad space, I guess. And yeah, so they had to they were digging out. So it was like Duffy's fill, I guess. So oh, okay, just, right. Yeah, yeah, filling in. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Roll sound. Rolling. Sound production. Take two. Well, when I came to Duffy's fill which is the bank made over to Steep Gully just above Malvern, and we all called it Duffy's Fill. While, while on each side where the fill was grubbed away was called Duffy's Cut. Duffy was the contractor's name. Well, as I was saying, the night was hot and foggy, so I trudged up between the stone blocks until I got onto the fill, and there I saw with my own eyes the ghosts of the Irishmen who were died with the cholera a month ago, a dancing around a big trench where they was buried. It's true, mister. It was awful. They looked as if they were a kind of green and blue fire, and they were a-hopping and a-bobbing on their graves. Scared? Well, I should say I was. I heard the Irishmen were haunting the place because they were buried without the benefit of the clergy, as they said, but I don't believe it. Well, mister, I was too scared to run, and I stood there knocking my knees together and the ghosts advancing and groaning all the time. Well, mister, at last I fell down. I don't know how long I lay there. When I came to, all the ghosts were gone. Ooh. That was good. Actually, the, the <laughs> rasp in your voice really added to it as well. Thank you. I think it made my laryngitis much worse. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was worth it. Uh, thank you. 
it's good. It's a, like it's a great ghost story. It is a good, good one. Yeah, I like that. It's creepy. I don't know. There has also been there's been numerous stories that have circulated about these eerie apparitions and supernatural encounters uh, connected to this particular railroad track known as Duffy's Cut. Just to be clear, Duffy's Cut was a cut between these hills, this like hilly area, and they so they cut literally through the thing to make the railroad track, and then it was surrounded by Duffy's Fill, which is a hill. Where they fill, that's where all the land went, so they fill. I think so. Like, I'm not a railroad engineer, yeah. so I'm not... It's railroad terminology. Really? Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. I think just so... Because I was reading this, and I was like, what the fuck is a fill? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. It's, But it is like, I, I think it's kind of like a hill. For sure, yeah. I can only imagine, like, Duffy's cut, like, as I said, like, he's, he was the contractor, and he had to build a railroad through this space. Uh, I know it was, like, notoriously really hard to kind of... This area was just mm. real rocky and shit, so... <laughs> Uh, I'm pretty sure they just had like cut through the area, I guess. So yeah. Was Duffy's cut. But uh, yeah, there was like numerous reports have poured in from local residents uh, about their uncanny experiences in this area. Uh, some folks they've confessed to having like an eerie sensation of just being constantly watched from the uh, from uh, from outside. One of the most like spine chilling accounts uh, from a local resident, uh, they described an encounter with a woman in black sitting in his Ooh. living room one one evening. And uh, this figure, they appeared to draw like all the light from the room in towards itself. And he just stared at her. And as he kept staring at her, she just vanished oh, into thin air. That is creepy. Yeah, it's good. That's scary. Yeah. I don't like that. Well, what um, don't like that? And like, this is like new-ish accounts. Like this isn't back from like, I know that account that you were saying is back from uh, 1909. But yeah. uh, like these are new newer accounts of people who like talk like newspapers and shit. Really? Like, uh, like so, oh wow. So this shit has been going for a while. It's gone about for a very long time. Whoa. Yeah. Hell, I've never heard of this. It's crazy. I've never heard of this. Before. Yeah, it's a good story. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, you can see how these are creepy ass ghost stories and how, you know, if you heard this as a kid, it would stick at you. I'm 32 years old and this story is sticking with me because <laughs> it's creepy as well. It's memorable. Yeah. Mm-hmm. However, as time went on and the twins grew up, they got older and wiser and the story faded from their memory. It wasn't until 28 years later, in the year 2000, when William Watson had his own run-in with the ghosts that the story kicked off once again. In September of 2000, William Watson, or Dr. William Watson to you, he was now a history professor at the Immaculata University, Pennsylvania. He stopped by the campus with a friend and a fellow bagpipe musician named Tom Connor during a long drive back from a performance. They stopped off for a break and shake the dew off the, off the lily while there. At around 10 p.m. near the faculty center lawn, which is within the scope of of Duffy's Mile, the whole area of where these apparitions were occurring, both both men witnessed a strange sighting. Tom saw it first, and then William saw the exact same thing. Three shining shapes of men out on the lawn in front of the faculty center that had no reason to be there. William stated they were shining in the same way like a tr- Star Trek transporter. Yeah, they said like, there were like a shi- like shimmering figures out there. I was listening to a podcast that he was actually on when he was describing this and he was saying that it was, he thought like it looked like special effects, like yeah. m- movie special effects. But right. He was like, why would someone do that? Like, there's no reason to have that such an elaborate prank. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What he said, it was so good and so real of these just like men just shimmering. How would you even do that? Like... It says, like, you're not looking at a screen. This is real life. Like, you can't add CGI and, like, yeah. Movie magic. Once the apparitions vanished, both men stood there with absolutely no explanation for what they had just experienced. William, he was left with more questions than answers. And it wouldn't be for another two years until William and his twin brother, they started putting it all together. What was actually interesting about that is... So later, William Watson, he actually discovered that this occurrence took place on the eve of an ember night. Ember nights, according to medieval Catholic tradition, they were believed to be nights where souls emerged from purgatory to find individuals who would pray for them and aid in their spiritual journey. Like I said, it's from like medieval times, this, right. this whole tradition. I it's not a thing we really kind of celebrate so anymore. I guess because he's like a professor of his history and he kind of knew about this stuff. But it was, he, did, he didn't realize at the time, but it was when he started looking back and he's looking at the day, he was like, oh my God, this happened on that ember night. Whoa. Holy fuck. In 2002, Frank and William were going through some of their late grandfather's papers and possessions from his time as a railroad executive to the president of the Pennsylvania Railroad when an old file caught the eye of William. The cover on the file read, Between Malvern and Fraser, Duffy's Cut Enclosure. William was intrigued, as this is near where he worked. 
When they opened the file, they read the account of a man walking down the tracks in 1832 when he came across shining figures. So yeah, he'd seen it in 1832 and people were seeing it all the way up to modern times. Yeah. And wow. Was like, oh my God, that's basically what I saw within the same area. Man, I kind of want to go there and like film stuff. Mm. This would be cool. That would be good. It's like the kind of stuff what I want to do with like the travel shows. Like I, I actually have no fucking patience at all for like ghost hunters. I always think it's like the biggest load of shit. <laughs> it's like kind of fringy and it's like boring. Oh, it was an orb. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's it always dust, an orb. Man, it's it was dust. Not only did they quickly connect the ghost story, their grandfather told annually at Thanksgiving, but William realized that the account of this man in 1832 corresponded almost exactly with what he and Tom had seen only two years prior near the same location. As they continued reading. The report outlined the mass death of workers on an arduous stretch of the then Philadelphia and Columbia Railroad in the summer and fall of 1832. Contractor Philip Duffy had hired 57 Irish immigrants fresh off the boat from Ireland to lay the tracks for roughly a mile. However, within 90 days of their hire, all would be dead. Ooh. The record suggested that all 57 had succumbed to a deadly disease due to the global cholera pandemic, which was rampant at the time. What does cholera do to you? I don't even know what cholera is. It basically just died from, like, diarrhea. Oh, really? Well, it's, yeah, it just makes you sort of really sick. I think of, like, the worst hangover you've ever had. And that's cholera. I guess, like, double it. Man, well, you think the Irish people would be pretty well used to that, all right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we didn't know. It was cholera. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Frank and William were compelled by the story of these laborers who tried to get a piece of the American dream, but were cheated before they could make anything of themselves. It was a heartbreaking journey that left them nameless, resting in an undistinguished resting place, and their families left in the dark, never receiving the news of what happened to their loved ones who left for America. Reading through the rest of the documents they found, it hinted at a possible cover-up, and things also didn't add up for the brothers. After all, only 25 to 50% of severe cholera cases can be fatal if left untreated. So it's weird that all 57 of them died at the same time. It should have been max like 25. Every single one of them died. That's fucking weird. It would have been like an incredible it's like, series of unfortunate events for every single one of the workers to die from cholera. This ignited the brothers' determination to uncover the full story. After all, it seems that the spirits of Duffy's Cut were not simply restless souls. They were seeking justice for their untimely demise. William, Bill, and Frank Watson, accompanied by two university associates, spearheaded an archaeological expedition aimed at locating the precise burial site of these victims. On March 24, 2009, the initial discovery of human remains was officially declared. Notably, a surprising revelation emerged during the analysis of the bones by esteemed physical and forensic anthropologist Janet Mongi. Her examination exposed evidence suggesting that the initially recovered skulls had likely endured blunt force trauma and gunshot wounds. That's a severe case of cholera, if you ask me. <laughs> Worst case we've ever seen. Yeah. <laughs> the cholera shot him and then beat him to death. <laughs> so what really happened to these poor unfortunate souls? Well, to figure that out, we need to journey back to the start. As previously mentioned, the seeds of this tragic event were sown 190 years ago, as a group of young Irish immigrants embarked on a journey from Dara, Ireland, aboard the British vessel named John Stamp. Their destination, Philadelphia, here I come, Philadelphia, where the prospect of a brighter future back on, I'm trying to do a Philly, Philly accent. What is going on? What the hell is that? Philly accent is kind of similar to like a Delaware accent. Um... In 1832, uh, no, okay. That's not even close. Ireland was faced with some interesting times in 1832. It had its fair share of challenges like socio-economic inequality, political unrest, and a sprinkle of widespread poverty. The folks relied heavily on agriculture, which was... Potatoes. Potatoes, potato man. But unfortunately, they were dealt a tough hand with poor harvests. One of the pesky old famines I keep hearing about. This led to some serious food shortages and folks being a little bit hangry. On top of that, the population was growing faster than a leprechaun's mischief. Never heard that phrase before, but I like it. <laughs> Putting a strain on the already limited resources. Ireland was under British rule and there was a fairly cheeky movement brewing for Irish independence and more of that. It was a time of challenges, conflicts and disparity. So it's understandable that people would jump onto the nearest boat to get off this dang old island 
in search of a better life. Like it's important to understand that the like the vast majority of the land in Ireland that was approximately ninety five percent of that was controlled by a small group of privileged families. So roughly about five thousand. A number who still remain loyal to the British crown. And these elite landowners, they focus on maximising uh, food production on their farms, primarily to export out to Britain. So unlike their counterparts in Britain, we didn't really embrace modern farming technologies. Mm. And we really relied on millions of ten farmers, cottiers and landless labourers who would work the fields. So the ten farmers uh, worked without payment in return for just a little patch of small land. And then the, the tenant farmers, commonly referred to as Irish poor, that was the thing. Yeah, it was like, you're not poor, you're Irish poor. By the way, he's saying poor. Oh, poor, poor. <laughs> sorry, Irish poor. <laughs> <laughs> Do you say poor or poor? I say poor. For those who don't know, Keith has this really weird affectation where if a word has two O's, you pronounce it like a U. Yeah. So purr instead of poor, uh, like coors. Yeah. Life, yeah, there's a few of them you do, and I know. Today, <laughs> what else? What other ones do you do? It look, but uh, we can say Luke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was like, oh yeah, some of these uh, citizens, like they were fourth class citizens at this point. They were even third class, or fourth class. Some of them were fortunate enough to reside in like modest cabins constructed from stone and mud, while others dwelled in like a rudimentary hovels built with natural materials. Like it was based on branches and mud put together. And it wasn't uncommon for like multiple generations of a family to totally share the same just one knowledge. area. Yeah, yeah. Despite the dire circumstances, they could always rely on one staple substance, and that was the potato. Potato. Yeah. It was like full of nutrition, thrived in like even the most unfavorable mountains uh, conditions, providing a vital source of food. Like all you need to do, if you just cut off a chunk of potato and you bury that, more potatoes will sprout. Oh, really? Is that how? I didn't know. Is that? I didn't know that. Didn't super, that easy super, super potatoes. easy to grow. However, like as you mentioned, when Ireland encountered a series of poor harvests and devastating famines, the situation became even more dire. And then the over reliance on the potato, the primary food source, proved to be a vulnerable crop. So when the failure struck, it basically an impoverished population. It put them into like real desperate conditions. Mm -hmm. I guess that's why they jumped on the boat. You're like, why am I saying I've got nothing here to save her? Yeah, exactly. Potatoes are a staple. It's like, yeah, we there's other food, but there's not enough of the other food to make up for what the staple is. All they had was potatoes. That's yeah. it. Because they didn't have, they weren't making money or anything. They just, all they had was potatoes. Yeah. And then the potatoes just left. Yeah, and there's nothing, there's not enough anything else to sustain the population. So because of that, one foggy April morning, the John Stamp, which is a British ship, had set sail. The young group of immigrants carried a mix of emotions. Yes, there was a tinge of heartbreak, but it was accompanied by a little old dash of adventure. They were fueled by tales of grandeur, whispered about the fortunes to be made building railroads in the new world and lo and behold just two months later on the joyful day of june 23rd 1832 as the john stamp gracefully docked in philadelphia fate had a delightful surprise in store a friendly irish contractor named philip duffy eagerly awaited the immigrants on the shore offering them golden opportunities you see duffy had landed a contract with the philadelphia and columbia railroad his task was to construct a marvellous section of track known as Mile 59, later famed as Duffy's Cut. I can only imagine the joy and relief in the most been shot. Oh, Jesus, straight off the boat and a bit of work, lads. Good for you. Like a shining saviour mm. at this point, like straight off the boat and they got jobs already. Right, yeah, and it's by an Irish guy, so we're going to be more trusting of him. It's like, oh, he'll look he'll out, sort for, us out. Yeah. He'll look out for his own guy, I think. Yeah. yeah. After enduring that horrible two-month journey across the mighty Atlantic, those job offers must have felt like sweet drops of nectar from the heavens above. Duffy rounded up a merry band of 47 men and even convinced one adventurous lady from the John Stamp to join the fun at Mile 59. With the 10 folks already living there, they formed a spirited crew of 57 ready to tackle the Philadelphia and Columbia Railroad project. Duffy had a brilliant plan for his hard-working crew. He wanted them to enjoy a little neighborhood independence by creating their very own shanty town, where there'd be no need to mix with the local neighbors. Oh, you'll love it. You'll, it's beautiful out here. Yeah, exactly. You have a hole over there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're going to be living there yeah. just for you. That's your hole. <laughs> yeah. During this time, the Irish were not as welcome in America as they are now, and a lot of Irish immigrants, they faced their own share of prejudice for a little bit. Not too bad. Irish had it pretty good. I always think it's so funny. We were like, the Irish had it bad. No, they did not. For about a generation, they had it bad. They, then after that, they kind of like, 
took over everything. They're kind of like run a lot of the country now. So they're doing all right. Well, that's it. Like we we don't uh, we we don't go into countries and try. We we get in quietly, have a bit of crack, and then we breed. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I can see why they hate it. You won't see us coming. And if you do, <laughs> you've won a first. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so they were willing to do the back-breaking work out of financial desperation, and Duffy took well enough advantage of this. To make matters worse, when the cholera epidemic spread to Philadelphia, the locals viewed the Irish as a source of the frightening cholera fever, which was devastating their community. They thought the Irish were bringing it with them. It was really unfair because... Prior to arriving in Philadelphia, the ship embarked on a journey up the Delaware River and it made a stop at Lazarado, the country's first quarantine hospital uh, located in Delaware County. So with the widespread occurrence of cholera across the globe, a doctor would have boarded the ship to ensure that none of the passengers were suffering uh, from the disease before they were granted permission to board the ship to proceed on to Philadelphia. Then. And then in the event that someone had been feeling a bit unwell, they would have been offloaded. Um, right. So it's important that the Irish were like, like unjustly held responsible for introducing cholera to the United States <coughs> and wrongly accused of causing like the epidemic in Pennsylvania. So it, I, it's important to note that there were, there were no cases of cholera among the pastors aboard the John Stamp. And all uh, individuals by the time that uh, they seen Duffy, they were given a clean bill of health and the ship proceeded on to its intended destination. So well, they know the Irish did bring cholera to America. <laughs> 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 Joke's on you! <laughs> <laughs> well, it's believed that more than 150,000 Americans died during the two cholera pandemics between 1832 and 1849, so yeah. I mean, I don't blame them for blaming the Irish. Fuck them. Fuck the fucking Irish. Fuck them. Fuck us. Fuck, fuck us. <laughs> Amid the sweltering heat of July and August, the epidemic cast its dark shadow over the Philadelphia region. The month of August in particular witnessed a staggering surge, with over 100 cases reported each day. The Irish shantytown, too, bore the brunt uh, of this when cholera decided to swing by the workers' camp for an unexpected visit. Cholera swept through the workers' camp at an alarming pace, fueled by the less-than-ideal living conditions. If any man showed signs of vomiting or diarrhea, they were promptly taken off the work line. Imagine being there and like needing to do like this intense manual labor. Yeah. All the while trying to hide the fact that you had like that you're screaming diarrhea. Shitting yourself. Yeah, yeah, that's rough. As news spread among the locals about the illness spreading among the immigrant crew, panic ensued. The railroad company, in an attempt to contain the situation, imposed a strict quarantine, prohibiting anyone from leaving. From this point on, the fate of the 57 workers took a mysterious turn, as it marked the final time they would be seen alive. The true extent of the brutal murders, which were found, what, 150 years later? Well, what actually happened will probably remain forever shrouded in mystery. Yet, the unearthed skeletons, meticulously examined by Watson's dedicated Duffy's Cut research team, already revealed the bone-chilling evidence of extreme violence and savage blunt force trauma. The initial discovery struck the team with astonishment. Seven coffins with over a hundred nails per coffin. A chilling indication of an attempt to conceal the murderous act. You either don't want somebody opening it and getting in, or you don't want some getting out. Maybe they were vampires. What, that's how, uh, what, Dracula did in the story? You come, you, come, you come over the boat, maybe they were on. Exactly. Yeah. Bram Stoker's Irish. It's all coming together. Forensic analysis confirmed that the seven exhumed skeletons were victims of deliberate murder, ruling out the possibility of succumbing to cholera. Uh, I'd say I'm fairly sure a gunshot wounded head is a pretty, yeah, exactly, it's a pretty clear indica indicator of what happened here. Among them, one worker's skull showed extreme signs of brutality and overkill. Standing tall at well over six feet, it's likely he fought against his assailants. His skull bore the grisly marks of a five-inch axe blow to one side, while the crown of his head showed evidence of a gunshot wound. Jeez. So he was axed and then shot. The other skeletons displayed similar signs of brutality, yet the absence of defensive wounds suggested they had been bound when this ruthless attack ensued. Man, this is grim. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Like, they, like I said, it was absolutely brutal what yeah. they did to these people. Like. It is known that a vigilante group emerged to enforce the imposed quarantine by the railroad company. However, the circumstances surrounding the fate of the initial seven victims who attempted to flee the scene remain shrouded in uncertainty. Whether their intentions were driven by a desire to evade sickness spreading through their shantytown, or they were seeking outside assistance for their community, remains a haunting mystery. 
What we can ascertain is that they were trapped and outnumbered, and the malnourished Irish crew succumbed to a savage attack. After their capture and tragic demise, they were entombed within coffins and transported back to the camp, where they were laid to rest. This is where it's like, it's a bit, it's sad. So the, the, the coffins that were discovered, they had been buried in somewhat of a ceremonial manner, uh, suggesting that their, their fellow workers and friends from the Shantytown may have like lent a hand in the burial. Possibly in a the pit, they may have dug themselves for, for the railway. So it's chilling to think that they may have actually helped dig their own resting place previously yeah. but uh, yeah according to information obtained from the railroad file it was discovered that some individuals managed to uh, as you're saying they escaped from the camp sought uh, and they sought to find some near nearby houses unfortunately it looks like they may have been like denied assistance and effectively compelled to return to the valley and the records confirm that several in individuals were aware of the dangers at the camp and attempted to escape only to be coerced back into the valley mm. so i guess like yeah there kind of is records of Oh yeah, no, there was people that were trying to leave, but we told them to return, but it seems like yeah, these seven individuals might have been the same seven individuals that yeah. uh, were found in the coffins with 100 nails. As for the exact circumstances surrounding the demise of the remaining 50 workers, that enigma still awaits resolution. The Watson brothers have found the mass grave where the bodies were buried. However, it is frustratingly concealed beneath modern railway tracks, rendering it currently inaccessible. That was probably part of the whole fucking idea. If Bill Railroad tracks, then nobody will ever dig it up. You'll never find it. Yeah. Nevertheless, they hold hope that recurring whatever fragments of truth lie within, although the unfortunate reality is that not all may be salvageable. After all the workers were thrown into the mass grave, efforts were made to keep this story quiet. Duffy did not want word getting back to Ireland as to, well, <laughs> nobody else is going to want to come work for him and he would lose uh, contract jobs. All Duffy wanted to do was get the, the mile done. He was an Irish guy himself, and he was selling out his own countrymen. The bottom line was the good old dollar. The Pennsylvania Railroad was also eager to keep the story covered up. A file did exist, but it was swept under the carpet, and would have remained there if it had not fallen into the hands of Joseph Trippikin, the Watson twins' grandfather. Seemingly blessed by otherworldly forces, the ghosts of the men buried at Duffy's Cut. As they say, the rest is history. Man, it's crazy. So it's like the ghosts help solve their own, solve their own mystery. Mass yeah. murder. Yeah. By yeah. saying, oh, we're here. Actually, what's really interesting is, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, there there was some long-standing folklore surrounding Duffy's Cut. However, it's worth noting that this folklore seemed to fade away after the excavation of the skeletons. The ghosts stopped appearing. Man, this is like a movie. Since then, no reports have emerged of anyone witnessing any occurrences. So the challenges faced by the workers, they weren't limited to just Irish la laborers at Duffy's yeah. Cut. So there was a nearby section of the railway where Chinese immigrant workers also endured. Right. Similar. They were labor. treated really bad too. Yeah. Oh, big time, yeah. There's an interesting ghost story uh, that also emerged in that area. So it's really super close really? to Duffy's Cut wow. as well. There was one particular story that really caught my attention and uh, involves a brother and a sister who uh, used to explore the woods near Duffy's Cut uh, around the 70s and 80s. Uh, and during their explorations, they would often come across like half buried old bottles, chinaware, plates, and at the base of the railroad. Curiously, uh, they would collect them, the, these items, and they would store them in like a small crawl space in the sister's closet. I don't know, kids are weird, man. I don't know <laughs> why they did that. I guess they were just hiding from their parents because they're like, put that back. <laughs> Plenty more crap in this house. But while the artifacts were in their possession, the family claimed to have experienced visitors knocking on the walls and ceiling in the little girl's room during the night. Uh, this was quite unusual, because at the time it was a new house that was built, I think it was built around the 70s, uh, to make such sounds. On a few occasions, the little girl, she vividly saw what she believed to be Asian individuals dressed in like rags, peering in through her second floor bedroom window. Strangely enough, uh, once the artifacts that she put in her closet, once they were, were removed from the house, the visitors, they no longer appeared. Ooh. And even like to the age of 40, this woman, she still maintains her story about the mysterious visitors she saw. Ooh. The moral of the story is like, don't abuse immigrant labor. And if you do, don't yeah. fuck with your stuff. Or just don't kill them at least. Just that's, don't do it. Yeah, exactly. Just don't do it. It's just rude. Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> there you go. That's a good story. I like that story. It's creepy. It's historical. Dark history. It's kind of got everything, actually. That's like a perfect story for, for old Mike over here. Thank you for doing some good research on the dancing ghosts of it. Duff is good. Oh, butter, man. Duffy's chop. 
Dog is jumped. I hope, uh, hope everybody else found it good. My voice is fucked. Yeah. I can't wait to record our next episode. We're doing a two for today. So we're, going, we're going to record another episode. It's going to be a long day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we'll go and do some vocal warm-ups. All right. Uh, I think that's enough shining on. Uh, all right. Here, thank you so much for listening, everybody. Um, much appreciated you doing so. And I hope you enjoyed this episode of the That Chapter Podcast. And we shall see you. Or, well, you don't see us, actually. We'll talk to you next week. All right. Cool. You're just... See you later. All right. Great. <laughs> Thanks. And bye-bye. Kisses. Mike out.